Welcome everybody to the service for the 6th of November. I do pray that you will all be truly blessed as you share in this time together with God. Looking at the parish this coming week, birthdays, the 7th of November, Carol Berger, the 10th of November, Pam Williams, and the 12th of November, Pam Schubach. We do wish you all a very happy birthday and that the year ahead will be truly blessed.
The Lord be with you. Praise the Lord. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So let us confess our sins, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments, and to live in love and peace with our neighbor. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, in penitence we confess that we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought, word and deed, and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, Christ our Lord, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us, pardon our sins and set us free from them, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray together the Collect. Almighty God, you are the Lord of the living and the dead. Prepare our hearts and minds that we may be ready to receive Christ's just and gentle rule. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The first reading this morning is taken from the book of Haggai, chapter 1, verse 5, to chapter 2, verse 9. Don't you see what is happening to you? You have sown much corn, but have harvested very little. You have food to eat, but not enough to make you full. You have wine to drink, but not enough to get drunk on. You have clothing, but not enough to keep you warm. And a worker cannot earn enough to live on. Can't you see why this has happened? Now go up into the hills, get timber and rebuild the temple, and then I will be pleased and will be worshipped as I should be. You hoped for large harvest, but they turned out to be small. And when you brought the harvest home, I blew it away. Why did I do that? Because my temple was lies in ruins, while every one of you is busy working on his own house. That is why there is no rain and nothing can grow. I have brought drought on the land, on its hills, cornfields, vineyards and olive orchards, on every crop the ground produces, on people and animals, on everything you try to grow. Then Zerubbabel and Joshua and all the people who had returned from the exile in Babylonia did what the Lord their God told them to do. 
they were afraid and obeyed the prophet Haggai, the Lord's messenger. Then Haggai gave the Lord's message to the people. I will be with you. That is my promise. The Lord inspired everyone to work on the temple. Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, Joshua, the high priest, and all the people who had returned from the exile. They began working on the temple of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month of the second year that Darius was emperor. emperor. On the 21st day of the seventh month of that same year, the Lord spoke again through the prophet Haggai. He told Haggai to speak to Jerobabel, Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, to Joshua, the high priest, and to the people, and to say to them, is there anyone among you who can still remember how splendid the temple used to be? How does it look to you now? It must seem like nothing at all. But don't be discouraged, any of you. Do the work, for I am with you. When you came out of Egypt, I promised that I would always be with you. I am still with you, so do not be afraid. Before long, I will shake heaven and earth, land and sea, I will overthrow all the nations and their treasures will be brought here and the temple will be filled with wealth. All the silver and gold of the world is mine. The new temple will be more splendid than the old one and there I will give my people prosperity and peace. The Lord Almighty has spoken. Hear the word of the Lord. Psalm 145 verses 1 to 5 and 17 to 21. I will exhort you, O God, my King. I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day will I bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and wonderfully worthy to be praised. His greatness is past searching out. One generation shall praise your works to another and declare your mighty acts. As for me, I will be talking of the glorious splendor of your majesty. I will tell the story of your marvelous works. The Lord is just in all his ways and faithful in all his dealings. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those that fear him. He will hear their cry and save them. The Lord preserves all those that love him, but the wicked he will utterly destroy. My mouth shall speak the praises of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name for ever and ever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. This morning's second reading is taken from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 1 to 5 and verses 13 to 17. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that was when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? Verses 13 to 17. But we ought to always thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctification work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm 
and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God, our Father, who loved us by his grace, gave us eternal encouragement and hope. Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Hear the word of the Lord. The good news is proclaimed in the 20th chapter of St. Luke, beginning at verse 27. Glory to Christ our Saviour. Then some Sadducees, who say that people will not rise from death, came to Jesus and said, Teacher, Moses wrote this law for us. If a man dies and leaves a wife but no children, that man's brother must marry the widow so that they can have children who will be considered the dead man's children. Once there were seven brothers. The eldest got married and died without having children. Then the second one married the woman and then the third. The same thing happened to all seven. They died without having children. Last of all, the woman died. Now on the day when the dead rise to life, whose wife will she be? All seven of them had married her. Jesus answered them, The men and the women of this age marry, but the men and the women who are worthy to rise from death and live in the age to come will not then marry. They will be like angels and cannot die. They are the children of God because they have risen from death. And Moses clearly proves that the dead are raised to life. In the passage about the burning bush, he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is the God of the living, not of the dead, for to him all are alive. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. People chase immortality in many ways. Some spend billions on, res on research in search of the technology or genetics or pharmaceuticals or a whole host of things they hope will allow humans someday to defy death or radically extend our span of life. Others spend vast amounts to leave a legacy by putting their names on buildings or allowing others to do so to honour them for some contribution they've made. They endow charities and educational institutions and start foundations to make an impact, support something they care about, leave something behind that will outlive them. Of course, it's not just those with money who want not to be forgotten, and it isn't new. The author of Ecclesiasticus, in the Apocrypha section of some Bibles, writing more than 2,000 years ago, makes a distinction between those with fame and those without, those we remember and those we don't. Ecclesiasticus 4, 1 and verses 8 to 9 8 reads, Let us now sing the praises of famous, our ancestors and their generations. Some of them have left behind a name, so that others declare their praise, but of others there is no memory. They have perished as though they had never existed. Here's reality. Some people we remember, others we forget. Not so fast, says the author of the Wisdom of Solomon, also in the Apocrypha, who states in poetic but blunt terms that, famous or not, I quote, our name will be forgotten in time and no one will remember our works. Our life will pass away like the traces of a cloud and be scattered like mist that is chased by the rays of the sun and overcome by its heat. It's the wisdom of Solomon 2 verse 4. Give it enough time and we will all be forgotten. But back to Ecclesiasticus for a moment. The author says there's a way to escape being utterly wiped out. Have children. Someone to leave your worldly goods to. Someone to continue your traditions and values. The author writes that the, I quote, wealth of those who die even those we don't remember, will remain with their descendants and their inheritance with their children's children. 
Their descendants stand by the covenants, their children also, for their sake. Their offspring, offspring will continue forever, and their glory will never be blotted out. Unquote. This is Ecclesiasticus 44, verses 11 to 13. Children, especially those who stand by their parents' commitments, are a way that names and family identity can continue in this world, even for the never famous. Problem solved. Although, truth be told, even the Bible is full of stories of families in conflict and disputed inheritances and children who cause their parents grief in their old age. So we know children are no guarantee of life on our terms, living on past our deaths. And what about those without children? This is a problem in the midst of the Sadducees' riddle told to Jesus to ridicule the resurrection. The custom they describe, still practice in some parts of the world, is a way to try to ensure that a child is produced if a man has died and leaves a childless widow behind. The dead man's brother, fathers, or tries to, to a child with the widow so that the deceased man will have an heir and his widow will have a child. She will not be alone. His name will be remembered. The life of the father will continue through the child. But there's nothing but death in the Sadducees' riddle. Brother after brother dies without producing an heir. Time and time again, the widow does not bear a child. Finally, she too dies. Who will remember her? Who will carry on the name and traditions of the family? Ah, says, say the Sadducees, all is not lost, we suppose, if you believe in the resurrection, which we do not. If there is a resurrection, perhaps she will not be alone after all. She has been the wife of seven men, which will be her husband in the resurrection. To whom will she belong? Now here is where Jesus gives a startling answer. Not only does Jesus promise there is a resurrection, but he changes all the terms in the Sadducees' riddle. Not only is life in that age, the resurrection, not just some everlasting version of life in this age, but if this woman is getting into heaven, it's because she is a child of God, not because she's a wife or a widow or a mother. It won't be because she was barren or fertile or married or widowed or forgotten or remembered on earth. It's because she is, as Jesus said, considered worthy of a place in that age. And like everyone else who enters the resurrection, I quote, cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection, unquote. Jesus says that in the resurrection, life will be different. There are things like marriage and customs around marriage and family life that are for this age. In that age, in the resurrection, your concerns about things like living on through others, like leaving behind someone to remember you, like dealing with the hardships of wanting something really badly, or being told you should have something you can't, won't be important. What will matter is being children of God. Jesus wasn't against marriage or children. Remember how tough he is on divorce. Remember how he welcomed children and blessed them. Remember how angry he got at the Pharisees for not taking care of their parents. We would have read in Matthew 15 verses 3 to 9. Instead, Jesus teaches us teaches that in the resurrection, making sure there are children to pass along the family story, the family name, even to make sure the con community continues, won't be necessary. Marriage is for this age. It can be life-giving in this age. It can be holy for this age. But it can't get you into heaven. And neither can having children or not having them, being re remembered by name or not. And maybe that means that Christians are to think seriously about what marriage is for, and how and why and whether we parent children, whether we try to live through them or raise them to know their first and most up important identity is as children of God, whether we regard them as the future or see them as the present, because here they are, gifts and children of God, right now. Christians certainly did not start to practice a new way of doing family by following Jesus. 
who did not marry, who did not father biological children, who formed a new family of those who do the will of God. I quote, My mother and my brothers, says Jesus, are those who hear the word of God and do it. This is Luke 8, 21. In Matthew's telling, Jesus includes sisters too, Matthew 12, 50. Jesus was all for family and created a family large enough to include blood relatives and those related only by being children of God. And Jesus' family, the church, would grow, not based on how many children people gave birth to, but through the sharing of the good news of God's love for all people in Jesus Christ and through the baptism that good news inspired people to undergo in order to join the family. So the family of Jesus would grow through people as varied as the Ethiopian eunuch who couldn't possibly have fathered biological children but heard the gospel proclaimed by the Apostle Philip and was baptized by him and takes the gospel back to Ethiopia. And Lydia, a merchant who is baptized along with her whole household and the jailer of Paul and Silas who is baptized along with his whole family it would grow because people like the unmarried Apostle Paul, the married Apostle Peter, and the Samaritan woman who had been married five times and was living with someone not her husband, all had encounters with the living Christ and had to share the experience with others. Being family with Jesus wouldn't be easy, and all the children don't always get along. They often squander their inheritance. They don't always pass along the important traditions as they should. They sometimes ignore or don't live up to the family resemblance. They need all the help of the good relationships of this age they can make, that can be nurtured by the church, because this age is hard. And yes, Sadducees, ancient and new, there is a resurrection. And those who will live in that age will be there whether their names were remembered in this age or not, because they are remembered by God, the God of the living and not the God of the dead. The God who is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is, not was, because even these ancient and flawed patriarchs are very much alive in God, our God, the constant, thanks be to God, between this age and the age to come. Shalom. Let us pray. Lord God, we bring before you the worldwide church, believers from all nations drawn together in faith. We ask for you to be with those who may be questioning their faith, who have doubts creeping in, and may be feeling lost and confused. Fill them with a fresh outpouring of your spirit so that they can feel the fire of faith kindled in their souls. We lift up those who do not yet know you and ask that you equip and empower your church to go forth and spread the good news so that they may be saved and your kingdom here on earth will grow. We remember those who are persecuted for their faith, where speaking your name causes division and puts them in danger. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of mission, we pray for the bishops, synods and all who lead the church. We especially pray for Bishop Dan and Reverend Mark and all who serve both in our diocese and here at St. George's. You know the needs of each of them and their personal circumstances. We ask that they feel your presence and know that the one who has called them and leads them is faithful. We pray for our parish of St. George as we seek to reach out as your light into this community that you have placed us. Help us to discern what is your calling is to do and help us to hear, see and understand the needs of this community and the individuals we meet. Help us all to walk alongside others in love and faith, sharing the hope and joy that comes only from you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of justice, we pray for the leaders of all nations, especially those engaging with COP27, which starts today. We ask that there will be good conversations and the right decisions made, and that these will be fruitful, not just hollow promises and political games. 
We pray for those leaders who are seeking to find peace in troubled nations and ask that hearts that may have been hardened will soften and changes made to seek the good of all. Lord of peace, we continue to pray for the people of Ukraine and Russia and ask for a peaceful end to the conflict to come soon. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of creation, we bring before you the natural world and all the resources of the earth. We know that as stewards of your creation, we have fallen short. So we ask that you show each of us what small changes we can make to restore this beautiful planet. We pray for all of those who have been affected by natural disasters. In a moment of silence, we will bring each before you countries or situations that you have placed in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for all who are in any need, kind of need, the sick in mind, body or spirit, the lonely, the bereaved, those who are trapped in cycles of despair. We lift to you all of those on our prayer chain, along with those only known to you. Put your loving arms around them, bring healing to those in need. We especially lift Gary Angelos and his family to you, O Lord. We pray for peace and strength, love and a gentleness of spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. We come now to the celebration of the Sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. Blessed are you, Lord, 
God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. For us it becomes the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. For us it becomes the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks and praise, Almighty God, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Redeemer. He is your living Word, through whom you have created all things. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh of the Virgin Mary and shared our human nature. He lived and died as one of us to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. In fulfilment of your will, he stretched out his hands in suffering to bring release to those who place their hope in you, and so he won for you a holy people. He chose to bear our griefs and sorrows and to give up his life on the cross, that he might shatter the chains of the evil one and banish the darkness of sin and death. By his resurrection, he brings us into the light of your presence. Now, with all creation, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious God, accept our praise through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Who in the night he was handed over to suffering and death, took bread and gave you thanks, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is broken for you. In the same way he took the cup, saying, This is my blood, which is shed for you. When you do this, you do it in memory of me. So we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering therefore his death and resurrection, we bring before you this bread and this cup, giving thanks that you have made us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon the offering of your Holy Church. Gather into one all who share in these sacred mysteries, filling them with the Holy Spirit and confirming their faith in the truth that together we may praise you and give you glory through your servant, Jesus Christ. All glory and honour are yours, Father and Son, with the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. As Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
The bread which we break, is it not a sharing of the body of Christ? We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, give us your peace. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Draw near and receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Feed on him in your hearts by faith, with thanksgiving. The body of Christ, broken for us. Amen. blood of Christ shed for us. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is gracious. His mercy endures forever. Almighty and eternal God, we thank you for feeding us in these holy mysteries with the body and blood of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and for keeping us by your grace in the body of your Son, the company of all faithful people. Help us to persevere as living members of that holy fellowship, and to grow in love and obedience according to your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Father Almighty, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out into the world in the power of the Holy Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. God bless Africa, protect our children, transform our leaders, heal our communities, restore our dignity, and give us peace for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, remain with us now and always. Amen. So dear friends, go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>